we are back. But we're not going to get into the nitty gritty yet, but we're going to prepare. Uh, we are going to five and six, and uh, we will next week look at the two chapters as a whole and then get into one of the problems. But I, I wanted to show, I'm so stoked about this because they fit together so interestingly. It seems so disconnected, these two chapters, but they really do go together. But this morning, we're going to read from chapter 1, uh, verse 1 through verse 9. And we're going to set the foundation for the next two chapters. And we'll come back next week to also pick some things up. But there's groundwork that has to be set before we move into 5 and 6. So if you follow with me in your text, we'll start reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul called as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling, with all who in every place call in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given you in Christ Jesus, that in everything you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you, so that you are not lacking in any gift, awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, blameless in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. For God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, I bring you back to 1 Corinthians, and we are going to focus on the first four chapters, but we're going to come back and look at these few verses, and I, I just sort of set a little bit of perspective for what is to come next week as we move into chapters 5 and 6. But really, Paul does this in his letters. He sets the groundwork and the salutation, the introduction to his letters, and he prepares us for what is to come. And when he begins to address this letter, we immediately find out that we're dealing with as a church that's at risk. And it's not a unique problem. It's interesting as we started looking at 1 Corinthians, we looked at the fact that they became very man-centered. And within the church of Corinth, man claimed the center. Now, this isn't just a unique thing for them. This is really an age-old problem. It goes all the way back to the fall. It goes all the way back to when Satan came and tempted Eve and deceived her. It goes back to the very first question he asked her. And it's interesting that if in your mind's eye you go back to Genesis chapter 3, and as Satan approaches Eve, he asks her a question. And all it was was just to sort of crack the door open a little bit. It wasn't a full-on frontal attack, right? It was subtle, and it was devious, and it was sly, and that's exactly how he works. But all he wanted to do with that question is to get her to become a little bit skeptic. Just to start to think. In other words, start to call God into question. Start to judge God. That then opened the door as soon as she responded. And we'll come back to that chapter in a little bit. I'm going to deviate how I normally do, but we're going to go to Genesis 3. But this is an age-old problem because with that first question, really what he began to do was opening up the door for the de-godding of God and for the autonomy of man. And that is a problem that has existed from the time of the fall and will continue to exist. So this isn't just a Corinthian problem. This is an our problem. This is a constant problem in our days as we walk through this life as believers. There is that constant struggle of trying to maintain God being the center of our life rather than ourselves. Of putting God upon the throne rather than ourselves upon the throne. And far too easily we find with the church that we see that it becomes very man-centered because when we come to church life, we tend to be a little more subjective. It's the strangest thing because we're the called out community of God. We are God's holy people. But for some reason, when it comes to church life, we tend to be very subjective. We, we tend to look at it from our perspective. And it has to do with just us. Especially when we gather together as worship as God's people. And so we find with Corinth that this was a problem that crept in. Now it's interesting because we looked at before in describing the character of the Corinthians. The, the, the designation to live like a Corinthian, this was not a, a favorable expression. And it was used back in those days to color different types of people. So in those days, they would refer to vagrants, drunk, drunkards, sexual deviants. They would refer to them as those who lived like Corinthians. In other words, the Corinthians were known for living a very debauched life. They were intellectually prideful and they were morally laxed. 
This began then to influence the church. And there's no doubt and no surprise, really, when you look at the surrounding of this church, that all of a sudden it started to reflect its surroundings. It really is our problem in the church today, especially in America. We reflect our surroundings. We're like a mirror that reflects the world back upon itself instead of what we are supposed to be doing is reflecting Christ onto the world. So this just isn't a Corinth problem. This is an our problem. The other thing that's interesting is we looked at the first few chapters. We saw that Corinthian spirituality was contextually redefined by Corinth. In other words, terms like wisdom, knowledge, spiritual freedom were redefined to match the Corinthian context. This isn't unusual for them. It's the same thing for us. When you look back in the early days of church history, we find the same thing happening with liberal theology. They began to take on the ideals of the world, but what they did was they took our theological terms and they used them to describe the world's ideas, and they tried to mix the two together. But whenever you try to bring God's wisdom and the world's wisdom together, you're going to compromise and you're going to reject the truth ultimately. So what Paul was going to have to do was he was going to have to redefine these terms for them. What they thought was maturity, Paul says, no, it's not maturity. You're acting like fleshly men. So the same thing for us in our life today is that we use these terms, but they've been given new definitions. I find that with pastors, it's we'll talk about, you know, use terms like expositional and exegetical and so on. And I realized uh, some years back that we use the same terms. We have totally different definitions. Same thing with theology. We now have these terms that we use, theological terms, but we're giving the world's definitions to them. And the world is doing this now. We find this with us in, in, in regards to our own vocabulary. The world is taking over our vocabulary. They give it a redefinition and they hand it back to us and say, here you go. They do that with scripture. President Obama, right? The golden rule. Use that to condone sinfulness, which God calls an abomination, right? So we take these things, they take them over, they, they take them and they redefine them, hand them back to us and say, okay, here, this is how you use it. We have to be cautious and be careful that we are not allowing these things to creep into the church. As Corinth did, we do the same. They were characterized by pride. They were characterized by autonomy. They were characterized by freedom of indulgence. We find this at the Lord's Supper in chapter 11. They come and partake of the Lord's Supper and they're getting drunk and indulging themselves on food, while others in the body of Christ had nothing, had nothing. And we listen to stuff like that and we think, that's just crazy. How could they do that, right? The Lord's Supper, this kind of stuff is going on. But that was happening in Corinth. They were self-sufficient. They were self-centered. They were self-seeking. They were self-serving. And therefore, ultimately, they were leading to self-destruction. And this is the problem when we turn inward towards man. When man becomes the center rather than God, it is destructive. Anywhere you look in Scripture, we see the same. Go back to Genesis. Go back to Romans chapter 1. Go to 1 Timothy or 2 Timothy chapter 3. Wherever you go in Scripture, we the same thing. As soon as God is removed from His proper place upon the throne, as soon as God is taken out of the center and man is put in that place, there is nothing but destruction that ensues. Look at our own life. Right? Look at our own life and we take our eyes off of God. Look how quickly all of the entrapments and the distractions and the things of this world creep into our life and lead us in the opposite direction. So the warning comes for us that we need to heed the instruction that Paul gives in the first four chapters of 1 Corinthians. And he is going to address several issues here. And so if I can, for the whole letter overall, it breaks up this way. Starting in chapter 1, verse 11, we have the divisions in the church, the schismata. Then we have, in chapters 5 and 6, we have the disorders, moral and ethical in the church. And the issue is the fact that there was immorality happening in the church and it wasn't being confronted. It wasn't being confronted. That happens when we're man-centered, not God-centered. We let sin go. We say, ah, it's their walk with the Lord. They need to deal with that. Let's not get involved, you see. But if we're seeking the glory of God, we get involved. And not to demean the other person, but to come alongside of them and help them back into a proper relationship with God in which they are worshiping God with their life, with their character, with the way that they live their life rather than walking in moral laxity. But if it's about man, we just, ah, eh, it's their thing. Let them take their journey. The last part is from chapter 7 through 16, the difficulties in the church. 
And Paul had received a letter and he had to address several issues. And so he unfolds those for us in chapter 7 through 16. But we are going to come back to 5 and 6. But I wanted to look at these because this sets the groundwork. Divisions in God's church, chapter 1, verse 10 through 421. And this is a result of a, a report that he received from Chloe's household in verse 11. Notice with me, for I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you. And then he goes on to explain in verse 12 what he means by that. And in other words, he's letting him know, look, I know what's going on. I'm not dealing on supposition. I'm not dealing on assumption. I know the facts. And verse 12 lays out the fact that he knows the facts. And I'll just say, you know, when we deal with one another's lives, deal with facts. I really, it drives me crazy when we take stuff secondhand from people, right? We hear someone say something about so-and-so, and it gets passed on down the line, and it comes to us, and then we draw a, a conclusion about so-and-so, right? But we've heard it like three people away, and we draw a conclusion on a situation or something in that person's life, and we even make a judgment on that person, and we don't even know firsthand. So Paul wants him to look, I know the facts. I'm not, I'm not supposing here, I'm not assuming here, these are the facts, and I know what they are. But he is going to establish a clear fact for us, and that is important when we get to chapters 5 and 6. The fact is that this is God's church. And I put it more emphatically because Paul is essentially going to highlight that through these chapters, but really is the church is God's. It is His. And if it is His, and He has paid such a price for it, if it is God's church, then we cannot do whatever we feel with it. It's not left to us in our own opinions and our own suppositions as how we want the church to be. It must be determined by God. And Paul is going to help sort of reclaim the center for God. So notice how he does this in several ways. First, he is going to address the fact that there are some misunderstandings in regards to the Corinthian church. So the first four chapters, he's going to deal with these issues. First, they are misdirected as to the church. They're misdirected as to the message of the church, the gospel. And then they are misdirected as to the ministry, the gospel ministry. They had some misunderstandings of these things. And so Paul is going to straighten them out. If I can put it in the Corinthian context, it's more like this. They were secularized in their view of the church. They were secularized in their view of the gospel message. And they were secularized in the view of the gospel ministry. They brought in the things of the world, they brought it into the church, and they started to view these things through the eyes of the world rather than through the eyes of God. So Paul is going to have to redirect their focus, but the problem with the quarreling is that they have so allowed the things of the world to infiltrate them without any sort of criticalness or without any kind of discernment and discretion. They've allowed these things to be absorbed into their life, these values and ideals of the pagan world around them, and it began to color everything about them. I mean, we would really like, I think, to borrow the words of Fee, we would really like to think that we are very much like the Apostle Paul, but the church today is probably more like Corinth than we care to admit. It's an interesting lesson. I was watching a car commercial the other night, and it was interesting because essentially it, it came down to this point, is that it, it doesn't matter the destination, it's the journey that counts. But this commercial took that thought process to a little bit further degree and just sort of wiped out the goal altogether. The, just It's all about the journey. But it was interesting because she made the statement, she says, you know, just think about this, that there are probably people out there who take that sentiment and that idea, and that is the driving force of their life in everything thing right a car commercial but people will take that on as like the driving truth of their life but the problem is is that we're doing this as the church we take in the ideals of the world and we try to Christianize them. we put Christian terms to them so we preach Christianese we use these Christian terms but we give the world's ideas using these Christian terms we even speak with a Christian accent but in reality when we look at the content it's not the church it's the world it's the world so Paul is going to bring them back to the values and the ideals of the cross. And that is a great place to start. Notice with me, chapter 1, verse 18. After he addresses the issue of there's divisions in the body, what is the first thing he's going to talk about? Verse 18 of chapter 1. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. What better way to deal with the self-centeredness of man and self-seekingness of man than to bring him to the foot of the cross? It's the best way to reclaim the center for God. So Paul is going to deal with these three issues. And this morning we're going to walk through them. First, it is God's church. 
And this he establishes in chapter 1, verse 2, and he is going to run this thought all the way through this section. So in chapter 1, verses 1 through 9, we saw this. It's interesting because he starts off immediately talking about our relationship with God. What better way to get our focus back on God is to talk about that relationship. So starting in chapter 1, verse 2, notice with me, he is our Lord, theirs and ours. And we pick up the word Lord from, from verse 2 and carry it into this last phrase. That's why it's in italics in our NASB. In the Greek text, it isn't there. It's just theirs and ours, but it's assumed that we pick up the Lord from verse 2 in the earlier part. Notice this, it is our Father, our Lord, our Lord. Over and over we have these statements of our, 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 our. These are all confessional statements. Notice how the Apostle Paul includes himself in these statements. Not your Lord or your Father or your Lord. It is ours, ours, ours. It's a confessional statement. We say this corporately. This is a great statement. A great affirmation that we all have this relationship with this one Lord. He is theirs and ours. But it's also relational, these statements. And I think this is important. So I'm not going to have you turn to Genesis 3, but in your mind's eye, go there. You can write it down. Make a note. This is very intriguing to me. So in Genesis chapter 2, right? We all know these chapters very well. <laughs> Genesis chapter 2. In chapter 1, we have Elohim, right? Jell can contest. So in chapter 1, we have Elohim, God, 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 all the way down through chapter 1. Chapter 2, there's a transition. It now is Lord God. And if you look at your English text, we have capital L-O-R-D, Lord God, all the way through chapter 2. In other words, behind the all caps of Lord is God's covenant name, Yahweh. Okay? So we have Yahweh Elohim all the way down through chapter 2. Now the interesting thing about chapter 2 is that there is this telescoping in and it focuses on man and his relationship to God. That's the focus. So we go from, generation, uh, from creation general all the way down to man in chapter 2. So we have this relational designation of God, Lord God, through chapter 2. Now here's what's very intriguing to me. Chapter 3, we have the fall, right? Comes the temptation. Satan comes to Eve and he asks her the first question. You know how he addresses God? Not as Lord God, but as God. Here's what's very interesting. Eve, when she responds to Satan, she does not say, Lord God said. She says, God said. Then when you move through the text, it goes back to Lord God, Lord God, chapter 4. Lord God, Lord God, Lord God, Lord God. Why is that fascinating? Here's what's interesting in light of this thought right here. If Satan can get a foot into our life and distance us from God, and I'm not talking about spatially distancing us from God or even positionally distancing us from God. In other words, you cannot be removed from your position of sanctification and justification. But if he can distance us relationally from God, he gets a foot into our life. In other words, if we just start talking about not as Lord God or my God or our God or our Lord, and we just talk about him as purely just God, that he is sort of like this idea rather than the self-existent, self-conscious being, personal being that we have a relationship with, if he can create distance there relationally between ourselves and God, he gets a foothold into our life. And if he does that, he gets into the church. So Paul is going to, in 1 Corinthians, and I'm just telling you, we go past these few verses, we think, ah, it's insignificant. It's totally significant. It's totally significant. Paul is regathering the church collectively, corporately, around one Lord. But at the same time, what's fascinating, in verse 4, notice with me, he says, I thank my God always. There's such truths here. Because all the way through here, it's our, our, our. And then he gets to verse 4 and he says, my God. And this isn't a, a self-righteous, possessive kind of thing in the sense like he's mine, not yours. What's the point of this? This reminds us that our relationship to the church is based on an intimate personal relationship with God. He is my God. He is my God. Although he is ours, he is my God. And I have an intimate relationship with him. But the other reminder in all of this as well, with all of those statements of our, 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 is to remind us that we cannot over-personalize one's relationship with God. I.e., when you get to chapter 5, there's incest in the church. Paul doesn't condemn the man who committed incest, although he pronounces judgment on him. Who does he confront? He confronts the church because they didn't do anything about it. You see, we do this in the church today. We say, ah, that's their walk with God. Just let them work it out. It's between them and God. I don't want to get involved. No, get involved. Get involved. 
We have today so Americanized these truths, right? Because in American culture, let everyone unto themselves, to their own things, to their own rights, their own privileges. Let them live their life. Don't interfere with it. Let them do their thing. We bring it into the church and we do the same thing. We see someone in sin, not right with God. And if we loved them and loved our God, we would want them right with God and bring them into that relationship with God. But instead, we are so Americanized, so culturalized, so secularized that we don't do anything. We don't do anything and we just let it go. Chapter 5, Paul's going to say, you have actually become arrogant over this. You puffed up because this is existing in the church. And what's even worse, he says, this stuff doesn't even happen in secular society. The other thing that's intriguing about how he reclaims the center is 10 times in 10 verses, he is going to mention Jesus Christ. So I give you the Greek text just so you don't take my word for it. You can see it for yourself. All the way through Christu Yesu, Christu Yesu, Christu Yesu. He does this all the way through chapter 1, verses 4, all the way into verse 10. But here's what's intriguing if you look at the English text. Over and over we have Christ Jesus, Christ Jesus, Christ Jesus, Christ Jesus, ten times in ten verses. He is focusing our attention on Jesus Christ, but here's what's in interesting is the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It's not just Christ our Savior. He is our Sovereign Master. Now, this is important, because know with me, chapter 5, turn with me to chapter 5. Notice how he is going to pick up on the Lordship of Christ. He does it in chapter 1, verse 10, when he confronts them. He says, now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of, literally, through, through the means, dia in the Greek text, through the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the authority by which I come to you. He is going to do a similar thing in chapter 5 when he addresses this immorality in the church. Verse 4 of chapter 5, in the name of what? Our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled, I will with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, I have decided to deliver such a one over to Satan. Chapter 6, it's interesting because he is going to highlight the Lordship of Christ at the end in verse 11. He says, such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified. Notice, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. Then in verses 12 through 20 of chapter 6, we're going to see the Lordship addressed throughout here. Verse 13, he says, Yet the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. Verse 14, Now God, who has raised, not only raised the Lord, notice, not raised Jesus Christ or Jesus, but raised the Lord, but will also raise up us also through His power. Walk down through this passage. Verse 17, but the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. So he is going to return to the idea of the Lordship of Jesus Christ in verses 5 and 6. He sets the stage here. He is not only our Savior, he is also our Lord and Master. And therefore we will bend our will to his sovereign will for our life. If we all collectively make that claim, our Lord, our Lord, our Lord, then we will walk in light of His sovereignty over our life. It's interesting if you go back with me to chapter 1. Through those few verses, it's interesting because he establishes it's God's church, chapter 1, verse 2. And then he affirms that fact through 4 through 9, talking about the gracious work of God. And all these we refer to as divine passives. God has, God has, God will, God has. So he makes a statement in 1-2, it is God's church, and through 4-9, through nine, he established the fact that God has done all of the work in saving us. It's an amazing truth. It's all of God's grace. But let me sort of give you imagery-wise, just visual aid, okay? I like to see things. I'm an artist. I like to picture. I have to have the visionary. So here's what's intriguing. Notice with me, this word right here. This is in the Greek text for to give thanks. You see this right here? It looks like our X. A, and then it looks like RP, but this is an R in Greek. This is Eucharisto. This is the word to give thanks. It's literally is to express gratitude. Now here's what's interesting. See these three letters right here? Notice the same three letters right here. This is the statement, upon the grace of God, this grace which He gave to you. So notice the thanksgiving is based upon the charis, right? The charis is based upon the charis. The grace of God. So in other words, he is talking about the grace of God that they have received and his gratitude to God is based on that grace. Now let me give you a visual of this a little bit. Here's what's awesome. 
He reflects on the fact that God has graced them. He has graced us. He has blessed us with so many blessings. He has done this for man. Right? But then Paul's natural response is to do what? Is to return praise back to God. It's the whole purpose in our life. He saved us and redeemed us so that we can worship Him. Right? I mean, that's the purpose of missions and everything else. But here's the problem with this, though, okay? Let's take the diagram a little bit further. If we look at this, we see that God is, He is to be the focus. Going back to the, the, to the Reformation, sola deo gloria, it was all about the glory of God. So the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. That is the purpose statement for all of our life. Everything we do from the time we get up to the time we go to bed is to bring God glory. But the problem is, is that we sort of shortchange this. What happens is we start to look at what God has done, the grace that God has given to man, and we stop right there. We don't return the thanks back to God. We don't complete the circle. In other words, we end up falling short of the glory of God. This happens often in the life of the church. This happens in our life. This is why Paul constantly is exhorting the church to be thankful, to be thankful, to be thankful, to be thankful. There's so much to thank God for. But here's the problem. We end up going a little bit further than that. We focus just on the dathese, the gift, that which was given to us. And we forget the giver. And he's not even in the picture anymore. So we look at the gift and what has been done for us, but we completely forget about God. And this is the problem in the church of Corinth. Instead of them boasting in man, they should have been boasting in the Lord. But they were boasting in humans and all of that they had. And they did not recognize the giver of their gifts. So all of a sudden, notice what happens. It's all about man. God's not even in the picture anymore. The slide is so subtle, so easy. Go back to Genesis 3. Satan works that way. He's crafty. He doesn't come full on onslaught into your face. No. He slips in the back door, gets his foot in first, creeps the rest of it in. But this is where we become. So then it infects everything else. We forget that it's God's message. Not only is it God's church, it's God's message. And I just remind you, when we think about the church, oftentimes we think missions is the ultimate goal of the church. No, worship is. Missions exist because worship does not. That's why we reach out to the world. We're leading people to Christ so that they can enter into a relationship with God and worship Him with their life. Therefore, when we understand then ministry and we're reaching out to people, we realize that the message we proclaim is God's message. We don't let man dictate how we come to God. God dictates how you come to Him. So notice the first few verses of chapter 1, verse 18 and following. For the message about the cross of foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will thwart the cleverness of the intelligent. Where is the wise man? Where is the expert in the Mosaic law? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made the wisdom of the world foolish? For since in the wisdom of God the world by its wisdom did not know God, but God was pleased to save those who believe by the foolishness of the preaching. Then verse 22 comes, For the Jews demand miraculous signs, but Greeks ask for wisdom. This opens the door and sets the prototype for everyone who puts stipulations on how to approach God. I'll worship God if, right? God, I'll worship you for the rest of my life if you just get me out of this mess. I will acknowledge your existence if you just deliver me. If, 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 all of a sudden, man is putting the stipulations on God. Therefore, we ha here we have man assessing God rather than God assessing man. We have man telling God, this is how you, right? This is how I'm going to approach you. And this is how I'm going to honor you with a relationship with me. And God says, no, that's not how it works. But see, we do this, and not, not so consciously in the church. When we think that ministry is about man and not about God, we compromise the gospel message. We are zealous, and that's good. We want to see people saved. We want to see our loved ones in heaven with us. But when it is just about them, then we start asking ourselves, how can I make this more palatable for them? How can I make it a little more acceptable? How can I make it easier for them to accept this salvation that is being offered? I'll take the other things, the awkward things, and I'll sort of sweep them aside. You know, the fact that, that Jesus was rejected by those he came to deliver. The fact that all of his disciples turned from him. The fact that he died on the cross and he was put to death properly by 
by the religious leaders. The fact that at the end, even his own disciples didn't even believe that he rose from the grave. I'm going to put all those awkward things aside and I'm just going to give them this little bit and then I'll give them that stuff later. You see, we start to compromise the message when we think that ministry is solely about man. It's not. It's about the glory of God. It's the glory of God. Meaning of ministry is not about man, then it is about God. And if it is about God, then it determines the mode and ministry that we have. And you walk through the rest of chapter 1 as Paul looks at the gospel message that we proclaim. It is God's power. It is God's wisdom. It is God's message. And we do it God's way. Paul says in chapter 2, When I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come with superiority of eloquence or wisdom as I preach a testimony of God. For I decided to concern myself with nothing more except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my conversation and my preaching were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but with the demonstration of the spirit of power so that your faith would not be based on human wisdom, but on what? On the power of God. There's far too many books out there that are man-oriented on how to evangelize, how to witness and reach the world rather than on God. And if it is focused on God, then we will do it God's way. The last thing that Paul addresses, it's God's ministry. And all the way through chapter 3, you can read through this on your own. Over and over, Paul is going to affirm the fact that it is God who does all of this. He is the one who gives the ministry. He is the one who gives the means pro to provide and do that ministry. And he is the one who determines the outcome. And in the end, everything is about God. And in chapter 3, verse 9, he reached that summation point. Everything is emphatic. God's we are co-workers. God's tillage field we are. God's building we are. Over and over, everything is God's. The message, the ministries, the ministers, everything. Everything belongs to him. So therefore, instead of saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of Paulus, I'm of Cephas, we should be saying, I'm of God. And that's it. That's it. But that doesn't happen in the church. We have so ordered ourselves around particular leaders. I am of so-and-so. I follow so-and-so. No, I am of God. I belong to God. And that is the center of everything that we do and must be. So the summation comes. And I end with this. This is interesting to me in chapter 4. Verse 6, he says this. He brings all of this to a head now. He says, Now these things, brethren, I have figured to be applied to myself and Apollos for your sakes, so that in us you may learn not to exceed what is written, so that no one of you will become arrogant on behalf of one over against the other. This is the summation of the argument, and it stops in this. And here I borrow this from my dad, the imagery, just so you get a sense of how it looks. Paul says in verse 6 that you might not go beyond that which stands written. He's talking about Scripture. And he is going back and picking up on all those scripture references that he has laid out in these first four chapters. The first one comes in chapter 1, verse 19. He says, For it stands written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. Over and over as he quotes scripture, verse 31 of chapter 1. For it stands written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Over and over he keeps appealing to scripture through the first four chapters. He bases every criticism and every correction and every affirmation upon that which stands written. He's driven by biblical principle and then he applies them to people. And he uses himself and Apollos as exhibit A. If we live this way, then we understand everything is driven by God. Everything is driven by the wisdom of God. Everything is driven by the power of God. Everything is driven by the perspective of God. If we flip the order over and we start at the top and work our way down, it's driven solely by man. That is the majority of the time where we function in the church today. It's driven by men, not by God. Think about conversations that you have in regards to the Word of God. It's interesting, when you think about having conversations, we talk and we use things from Scripture. But it's interesting, if you just stop and listen to a conversation and the things that are people are saying, see if in your mind's eye you can fix a text that that comes from. Or even in your own words, when you're talking to someone, giving them advice or instruction, can you in your mind's eye bring a passage to your mind's eye that you are speaking from? Most of the time we don't do that. A lot of times when we're having conversations with each other, we're just talking. And sometimes if you stop and listen to conversations, the things that people say, you're going, that's really not quite jive with Scripture. But we give a little spiritual words there, right? We might borrow a word from, from the Christian realm and throw it in there and we mix it and we just hand it over. And it sounds like great spiritual advice, but when you step back and look at it and weigh it by the Word of God, you go, that's not biblical. 
Now, I'm not saying that when we have conversations, we need to sit down, and every time I sit down and have a conversation with Robert or Erica, I sit down and Brandon, I just sit down and go, okay, here, passage, this is the passage, this is the scripture reference, now let's talk about it. But at the same time, we don't do that enough. We don't do it enough in theology. We don't do it enough when we give counsel and advice to people. When you give advice to someone that comes to you and they ask you a question about life, do you in your mind think about a passage and then address the issue from the Word of God, or you just spew something out? Do you fix it in a context? Paul did that all the way through the first four chapters. It stands written, it stands written, it stands written. Every evaluation that he made, everything that he affirmed, every point that he took them to was based solely upon the Word of God. And the amazing thing about the first reference in chapter 1, verse 19, it's not a proof text. If you look at that verse, go and take it back to its original context and study in its original context. Paul understood that verse in its original context. The principle was there. He brought it over and he applied it to their situation. We don't do that. We have our proof text that we memorize, those verses that we memorize that supposedly teach things, but they don't always teach the things that we say they do. Give an example, brother came one time, he says, Steve, I had these two meditations I read in this book and they just, they, they moved me this week. And I said, oh, awesome. He says, I want to share them with you. I said, great. So he came over and he says, here's the two meditations. The one was from Hebrews, the other one from Psalms. So he showed me the one from Hebrews and I said, awesome. I said, well, let's look up the passage where this is from because the verse was cited. So we went to the passage in Hebrews and we looked at the surrounding context. We looked at the meditation. We said, man, it's just awesome. It flows right from the text. So I said, well, let's go to the one from Psalms. We went to Psalms. We looked at the verse. We looked at the passage. We read through it. I didn't say a word. I just sat there and watched. And we read through it, and he just stops, and he looks at me and says, where in the world did he get these thoughts from? It doesn't say anything like that. But then I stopped, and I said to him, I said, now imagine how many Christians read this book, read these meditations, and they automatically assume that these verses teach these truths, when actually a lot of them don't teach those truths. Are we weighing everything by the scriptures? Do we are we driven by that which stands written? Do we know the text? Are we filling ourselves up with the word of God as, as Warren likes to say, and I love that fact, of filling yourself up with the word of God constantly. You look at Jesus when Satan brings him and tries to tempt him. Three times Jesus responds, what? It stands written, it stands written, it stands written, and he appeals to scripture. He quotes scripture. Do you quote scripture when Satan tempts you in your life? Are you ready with passages so that when he comes or whatever sin you're wrestling with, are they there that you are spewing them out in your heart and your mind towards Satan as you refute and you turn away from the temptation that he's bringing before you? Most of the time we don't, right? Most of the time we don't. You look at the church council in Acts when they had a problem in regards to the church. They sat down, they discussed it, and then they said, it stands written and here's our decision based on that which stands written. Does that happen very often in elders' meetings? Not as much as it ought to these days. But what about our own life? It comes down to simply us. How are we with the Word of God in our own personal life? Are we driven by that which stands written? Do we know the Scriptures? Are we studying it? Can we fix those principles clearly in their context? And are we driven by that? Are we principally driven people by the Word of God? We are to be people of the book. And we have to be in our own personal life. I can't look to anyone else. I've just got to start with me, right? I can't change your life. I can only change my life, right? As much as we'd like to reach into each other's lives and turn it around, it starts with my relationship with the Word of God. Do I base my life on that which stands written? And then what about my family? As a leader in my home, am I driving them to the Scriptures? And am I challenging them to live based on that which stands written? clearly in the Word of God as principle for life. And what about us as a community? Are we driven by the Word of God? Are we principally driven people? These things are important because then we come to the issue of sin in that. If we are in the Word of God, we are saturating ourselves with the Word of God. If we are in that which stands written, we will see the sin for what it is and we will respond in the way that God wants us to. If we are not, we will not and we will let it go and we will let them walk away from the relationship and worship of their God. So that leads us to the disorders in the church and Paul's condemnation on them in chapters 5 and 6. And next week we'll return to them and look at them in more detail. But may God help us. May God help us as we seek to be God-oriented, God-focused. May that be the purpose of our life from the time we get up to the time we go to bed is to glorify God, to glorify Him, right, and enjoy Him forever. Robert, would you close in a word of prayer?